have to do a thing where I unplug my own in order for us to see you. Okay. That's work. Okay. Alrighty, there we go. So, uh, class, can you please say hello to uh, Professor Blackman? Hi. Hello, Hi, everybody. How's you doing? <laughs> so this is gonna be kind of weird because you can see me, but I can't see you. Yeah. I'm looking at a door. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's almost like I'm looking at an empty chair. It's almost like Clint Eastwood esque. But uh, very good. So how's everyone doing today? Doing well, and you? I'm doing great. I was actually just in California this past week, and I was in uh, San Francisco. As was I. Where are you guys looking? <laughs> Where's your school? Uh, East Coast. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the only way that this might work, I'm trying to think. I can't. You're not allowed to. Because I can't see if you're raising your hand to, to participate. So I'm going to have to rely on your teacher. To, if I say anyone have a question, she can just call on someone, and then she will call on whoever uh, raised their hand, okay? Okay. <laughs> Sounds good? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, so you're all probably a couple years away from applying for college, right? You got a couple years ago. Yeah. Yes. Does anyone know what California's policy is for California schools about affirmative action? Does anyone know? Sean, uh, don't they take race into consideration? Not anymore. Oh, oh. You might not know this, but in California, there's something called Prop 209. You always have these propositions that come by every couple of years. The California Prop 209 says that California schools cannot use affirmative action for college. How many of you knew that? I'm sorry. I just told them that they should probably be taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> on some of the things that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, you'll probably go in a couple of years. Uh, they are asking you to uh, repeat the Prop 209. Right. Prop 209 was passed in 1996. And that said for all California colleges, both public and private, that they cannot use affirmative action. They cannot consider race, gender, uh, uh, ethnic, or ethnic origin when admitting people to higher education. How many of you knew that? Right, so does anyone know why that law was passed? Well, why do you think it was passed? All men are born equal. Oh, all people are equal. I, I can't really hear the students too well. So you may have to get up. Okay. Here's the mic. How about this? And this might be stupid. If someone wants to give an answer, can you walk in front of the camera maybe so I can see you? Would that be impractical? Because I'm just looking at a door and it's getting kind of weird. Can you, do, you can just talk right there. Go ahead. Okay, I'll wave to him. Hello. <laughs> hey. uh, is it because, like, the thing in the Constitution that says all men are born equal? Well, the thing you're thinking sure. of is actually the Declaration, which says we were all endowed by a creator's turn in the right, <laughs> not the Constitution. I forget things. <laughs> but the broader question, really, is why would the people of California be opposed to having use of race in higher education? Come on, hand waving guy, what do you think? Would you guys just read the balance? Yeah, that's true. Equal protection. Equal protection. I'm back again, and I got, I got a good answer. The 14th Amendment. Good. And what does the 14th Amendment say? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> There Could you repeat order. the question? I was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> what does the 14th Amendment say? Why is that relevant? Well, um, all people are protected or treated equally under the law. You can't be like in each state and, you know, same protections and all that. So does, a 14th, does, does affirmative action violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution? Yes. 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 <laughs> does it? No. Okay, you guys, hold on. So somebody, it's not, doesn't I'm not have about to be sure. Steven. Steven. So, Sean, did you want to come up and answer? Yeah, I have a question, actually. Okay, we'll come up and answer. Yeah, just, just walk in front of the camera so I can see another person. Okay. Okay, so does Prop 209 stop financial aid based on race as well? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's only about admissions. Okay. 
Okay, and what was, uh, he had a second question. Did you guys answer it? So the question is, does using affirmative action, that is, does using race in higher education violate the protection clause? Is it, is it unconstitutional to consider race when you're admitting people to college? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Depends on what the Supreme Court says. Yeah? Why? Because that would be unfair. Because what? Because that wouldn't be equal treatment under the law. Hmm. Because that wouldn't be equal treatment under the law. So I can't tell, but how many people in the class, and you can raise your hands, think that considering race in higher education is unequal treatment? Raise your hands. Heads down. Heads down. Raise your hands. Let's see if I can do this for you. Oh my God, people! I don't know if you can see. Yeah, I can see. <laughs> heads down. Raising hands. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Okay. All right. So, can someone who just raised their hand tell me why using race in higher education might violate the protection clause of the Constitution? You guys have it in front of you. Okay. So, uh, Jordan, come up. Uh oh. Second well, wait, be specific. Um. That would be illegal because it violates the Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment. But what aspect? Well, why? Um, because... Um, is it in here? Is the mm -hmm. Equal Protection Clause in here? Where is it? Okay, hold on. Sam, come on up. Get up here, Sam. Jordan, go sit down. Okay. We're I'm having a, um, oh. uh, Professor Blackman, we're having a walk up because the mic isn't, uh, isn't catching what they're saying. I know, so I, can't, I can't hear them when they're standing far back. Yeah, so they're just uh, walking up. Go ahead. Um, is it because the laws of a state must treat an individual in the same manner as others in similar conditions and circumstances? No, that's a good answer, right. So there's one argument that says that affirmative action is unconstitutional because it violates equal protection. It's saying because you are a certain color or a certain race or a certain gender, you should be getting an advantage over others. But there's, an, but there's a different position. Um, does anyone in the class think that affirmative action is constitutional? And please come up and uh, uh, um, uh, say, say why. Um, I think that affirmative action in schools is constitutional because most schools are private institutions and that private institutions should be allowed to discriminate as much as they want. <laughs> Interesting. Well, let me, don't sit down. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Sorry. What about public schools? Public schools? I think that's a lot harder of a question, and you know that'd be a good idea for the Supreme Court to hear that question and rule on that. <laughs> no, but so you think that private schools could discriminate as much as they like? Yeah. So if a private school didn't want to admit African American students, would that be okay? Yeah. Really. Didn't want to make girls, would that be fine? Yeah, they have boys' yeah. schools. Yeah. Okay. Did only want to admit Catholics, would that be okay? Well, the Constitution doesn't give the government the power to regulate that, so I would think yes. Okay, interesting. All right, so who here can actually tell me what the Supreme Court has said about affirmative action? I think so. Who wants to come up from? Um, uh, hold on one second. Sure. Who wants to recap, Backy? Um, you guys pick somebody in your group to recap the precedent. Um, Come on, you guys. You're always ready to talk. Let's go. Okay. No. You guys over there? Okay. Come on up. We'll have a couple of responses. They're a little shy right now for some weird reason. Oh, don't be shy. Come on, just They're they're never shy. Okay, here we go. Um, in the case of Regents of the University of California versus Bakke in 1978, they, uh, they ruled that a quota system in which they had it where 16 out of 100 spots for incoming students were reserved for minority candidates. Mm -hmm. And they said that it was um, unconstitutional and that while they may use the applicant's race as a, as a consideration, um, they they can't use it as the only factor. Okay, good. So so tell me, what's a quota? What does it actually mean? 
Um, I'm not sure exactly what that means. <laughs> All right, anyone can tell me what a quota is. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Okay, you can go sit down. It's a, it's a requirement, pretty much. Right. So in other words, a quota says, say there are 100 seats in a freshman class. 17 will be reserved for persons with minority. That's what it means. It's clearly setting aside a certain number of seats for persons of a certain race or gender or whatever. And you're exactly right, uh, whoever that disembodied voice was. In Backey, the court said that quotas are unconstitutional. But in a somewhat confusing opinion, the Supreme Court said that you could use race in other manners. Um, who here can tell me how the Supreme Court said race could be used in the Bakke case? You guys are supposed to use it. Okay. Somebody's coming up. Okay. They, said, they said that it could be used only as one of many factors in order to promote diversity. Good. Good. And that was actually Justice Powell's concurring opinion, um, if you study the actual justices. It was a very, uh, what we call, fragmented opinion, but wasn't very clear which position contained a majority. Uh, but Justice Powell's um, uh, vote for concurring was very much in favor of using race to promote some kind of other, uh, other interests. So that case was 1978. And then for much of the 1980s, and really the most of the 1990s, the Supreme Court didn't really do much about affirmative action in higher education. It did talk about affirmative action, though, in other contexts. For example, um, a government contract. So if the government wants to give a contract to pave a road or something, or if they want to give a government contract to build a TV station, um, the Supreme Court said that you can't use race as a factor. It can only be used as one of many factors. Okay. That brings us to the 1990s, um, when California, your home state, passed Prop 209. What Prop 209 said is that the government cannot use, I'm sorry, that colleges, both public and private, in California there's no difference. Um, to the student before we gave an answer, in California all schools, public or private, are held to the same standards, have a unique uh, rule. But in California, the people voted in proposition saying that colleges, public and private, cannot use race or gender or any other uh, characteristic when admitting people to higher education. So that was 1996. And what case was that? There was no case, actually. It was Prop 209. It was a, it was oh, a referendum right. passed by the people of California. Um, okay. Sometimes the people can actually change the law as well, not just the, uh, not just the courts. We forget about that sometimes. So that was in 1996. So who can tell me what the next big Supreme Court case was about affirmative action? Okay. All right. Come on up. Okay, so um, in 2003, it was Grutter versus Bollinger. Good. Right? Tell, me, tell me what that is. Um, it was it was um, the Supreme Court ruled that the Michigan Law School could um, put importance on a race because they were trying to promote diversity on their campus. What does that mean? Um, they wanted different. Um, races in their campus, but they didn't set a specific number, they just wanted to make sure there was like diversity. So was Grutter the only case decided that year in affirmative action? No. What was the other one? Um, I don't know. Um, we, uh, we, have, we have a couple of different people who are, who are coming Oh yeah, bring, bring them up. It's like a buffet. Uh, who's seeing the next one? Who did I say? Um, you or no one, doesn't matter. Go ahead, uh, parents. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so I'm just describing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, name of the case. Uh, so, uh, parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District Number One. And this is 2007. Um, okay. So, in Seattle, most popular school choices became oversubscribed, and so the administrators had to decide which students could receive their top choice. Oh, okay. Um, so one of the most important things about their decision was that um, the students' race, and often the assignment or the decision would be a factor of their race. And so then Chief Justice Roberts uh, made it invalid, the program, and he made it so that it was uh, violating the Equal Protection Clause. 
and uh, it distinguished it from Greer versus Bollinger because the program's only goal was to ensure racial diversity instead of more holistic diversity in higher education. Okay, very good. Um, so there have been a couple of recent Supreme Court cases. The first one you mentioned was the Michigan case. And there were actually were two cases from Michigan. There was one from the University of Michigan undergraduate and one from the University of Michigan Law School. The program from the University of Michigan undergraduate was very, um, very specific. It said, you know, you all know what the SAT is, right? You all know what your GPAs are, right? So every factor in a person's application had a certain number of points. SAT was worth certain points, GPA was worth other points. Race was actually worth X number of points. So say, for example, if a person was African-American and had a certain SAT, their application was worth a lot more than a person who was white with the same SAT score. It was a straight-up boost. There was no um, balancing of factors. It was a very clear addition of points for people with, a, with certain races. The law school had a slightly different program, where they had what they called a holistic take on it, where they were able to um, use race as one of many, as one of many factors. The Supreme Court found that the undergraduate program, which simply added points for minorities, was not good. But the law school program, which used race as one of many factors, was good. So after 2003, there was this new sense that affirmative action could be used only in a very small set of cases when race was used as one of many factors. Moving forward, um, the uh, Supreme Court in 2007 had the Seattle school case, one that, uh, that, the, that the student mentioned a minute ago. In this case, the Seattle schools use race as a way to assign people to the best schools. And the Supreme Court said that, that you can't do that. Although there was a concurring opinion by Justice Kennedy which left open the door for um, some uses of race in uh, education. Okay? So I'm going to try and show a video now. I hope this works. I think it works. About the, um, about the Fisher case. Wow. Yeah, so, okay, can you see the video? Say use app, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All right, did that video just start playing for you? Wow. Well, hold on, it's making us click on a bunch of things. Sorry, okay, click, click away. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's... You can do screen share. Mm -hmm. Hit X on that. Where? Yeah, notice. X on the notice. Yeah. Okay. And then. Austin. On maybe. Let me see if it pulled it up. Do you, just just have them tell you the video on one of the views. Or like find it on online yourself. You can tell it to chat it, chat a link it, chat. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's not pulling it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Copy and paste a link and then send it to you. Where's that? Alright, here's what we'll do. I'll just screen share it. One second. You want to just email me the link? Yeah. Uh, I'll just screen share it and I'll be easier. Screen share means that we'll see it's on Facebook. Okay. Like okay. Screen. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Guys, how do I get rid of this now? This is a Harlan Institute fantasy cast for Fisher at the University of Texas at Austin. This case brings the issue of affirmative action in the university admissions process before the court once again. The first time the Supreme Court dealt with the issue was in a 1978 case called Regents of University of California v. Mackey. In this case, the court held that a California medical school violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution by setting a specific quota for minority students during the admissions process. Then, in a 2003 case called Grutter v. Bollinger, the court revisited the issue, this time upholding a university's admission plan that took an applicant's race into account for the purpose of ensuring diversity on campus. In the wake of these cases, the University of Texas created an admissions program that uses race as one factor in admissions decision making. Abigail Fisher, a Texas high school student, filed suit against the University of Texas at Austin when she was denied admissions from the school. She argued that when the University of Texas considered her race in rejecting her application, they discriminated against her in violation of the Equal Protection Clause. 
The case was heard by the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas, and the court upheld the university's program. They found that the Texas program in this case was sufficiently similar to the affirmative action program that the court upheld in Grutter. Therefore, it did not violate the Constitution. After Fisher appealed this decision, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals heard the case. The Fifth Circuit affirmed the lower court opinion, upholding the University of Texas program. Fisher appealed once again, and on February 21st, the Supreme Court decided to hear the case. As this hot button issue comes before the court, the justices will be asked to decide whether the University of Texas admissions program violated the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution and, more generally, whether affirmative action programs still have a place in public schools. Thank you for watching this fantasy cast. For more information, please visit harlaninstitute.org or fantasyscotus.org. Okay, everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So, this is the issue we have now before the Supreme Court. We have this case of Fisher versus Texas. Um, I am, I'm actually a professor in Houston, Texas. I'm actually not too far from um, where this case began. And one of my current students actually went to high school with Abigail Fisher, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, they said she was very awkward in class. <laughs> so the Fisher case involved Abigail. Abigail is a, is a white girl. She's from right outside of Houston. She applied to the University of Texas at Austin for college and she was not admitted. She actually went on to go to Louisiana State uh, for college. Fisher said, the reason why I was not admitted is because I'm white. She said that it was unfair that the school used race when, it, when admitting her. She doesn't say that had she been black, she would have been admitted. Her grades were okay, but not that good. What she simply says is the fact that I was Admit, uh, considered under a policy that considers race is bad. It's unconstitutional. Okay? Who here thinks, and please just walk up to the microphone, that Fisher's right, that it was unfair that they used race when admitting her into college? Put this down, hands up if you agree. No, I know, but there's too many. So this is people who agree. Who thinks she should have been admitted? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, not many. So I assume the rest of you think that it's not okay to use race, okay. or that, that race... If you think it's not, it wasn't. Was it okay to use it? No, that, that's what we just voted yeah, that's that's what we just voted No, no, the other way around. That, that, that Fisher is wrong, that uh, school okay. should be using race. Okay. Okay. All right, so if any of you want to come up and explain why, I think that's an important question. When the school is using race, what is it trying to do? What, what, when the school considers race application, what is it trying to achieve? Uh, <laughs> well, it's trying to get racial diversity, and I don't think that, um, that Fisher is right because it's with other factors. Right, they're, right. they're not just um, looking at race. They're looking at her other factors, and such as grades. What's racial diversity? No. No, that's racial it. diversity. Well, they want different races at the school so that, yeah, they just want uh, yeah, multiple races at school. What, what's the purpose of having all these different races on school? <laughs> Um, it leads to like educational benefits that flow from different um, racial backgrounds. How does that work? Why does having people of different backgrounds improve education? Um, they're brought up a different way, so they're like exposed to different things when they were younger. So is race the only way to achieve that? No. Well, what other ways could you achieve that? Where you grow up, um, religion. Maybe, maybe how much money you have. Would that matter? Yes. Right. So the main argument by the schools is that. I'm, I'm sorry, Professor Blackman. Um, we have one more comment on that. Please go ahead. Okay. 
So racial diversity in school is being promoted because not mainly for educational reasons, but for the social aspect of college. And that's because if you have a wide group of people raised up in a variety of environments with different characteristics to them, it's going to result in the more like cultural, worldly class, and it makes for better citizens. Okay. Uh, does anybody so, else, uh, can I jump in here real quick? Please. Thanks. Um, so does anybody else think that, um, uh, that they still have those uh, affirmative action because um, uh, schools um, still could discriminate and that we have not, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment haven't been fully realized yet? 13, well, 14th Amendment hasn't been fully realized. Remember, 13, 14, 15 all happened because of what? Civil War. Okay. So, um, and it was all, um, so the 14th Amendment then um, was, was applied to, um, uh, was applied to other groups as well. So who thinks that, um, that this is still um, being done because um, of the fact that the 14th Amendment was not being applied by all states all the way up until um, uh, 1970s and even now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, and I, I think that that's a good point. It was actually my next question. Um, predicted it. To what extent does a government have a responsibility to make sure that the remnants of segregation and the remnants of discrimination in our society are fixed? One of the main arguments in favor of affirmative action is that for a long time, a lot of people didn't get a fair shake in this country, and African Americans had a really, really, really difficult time um, getting into schools. Um, in the Michigan Affirmative Action case, the Grutter case, just so Congress said, listen, affirmative action isn't a permanent solution, it's a temporary solution. Maybe in 25 years we won't, we won't even need affirmative action, we still need it to help people who are put in a disadvantaged situation. Um, do any of you think that that's an important reason why we should have affirmative action, and for that reason Abigail Fisher should lose? Yes. Please come up, do you have a comment? Anybody want to comment? I, I agree. Well, I mean, I completely agree with that, and I think that Abigail Fisher is wrong because it's a lot. It's it would be a lot harder in a if you're living in a like very lower lower class uh, society, and you get like the same SAT score and the same grades as someone who's brought up with a lot of money. That shows that like you had to work a lot harder, and that I think that person should get priority regardless of race because and like that also creates social diversity for the next generation so I think that because of those two things it's important to have like to like recognize that if you come up in a harder in like a place that would be harder to achieve that when you do achieve you need to be recognized for that right I think that's a good point I think you made an interesting comment you talked about income so before you sit down I can ask you another question why, why can't you just base it on income? Why could you say people of a lower income are admitted? Why do you have to make it based on race? Because when you base on income, you don't have any problems with the 14th Amendment. Because um, if you just base it on income, then you might you still, because then you might not get the diversity anyway. Like There could be a lot of, for example, like white people who are just like very lower to middle class who all get in instead of uh, if I mean I don't know that's a good question I'd say that I mean, well, let's put it this way what if there's a really poor person from a white family who lives in a bad neighborhood and you know maybe Tiger Woods is son <laughs> yeah you know one of them's an African American one's really poor why should one be getting a preference or I think even like a P Diddy's son got to UCLA use that as an example you know P Diddy okay I mean someone who's a, who's a minority but of a, a vast means compared with someone who's maybe a white but just doesn't have a lot of money. Just, why, why should one be treated better than the other? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that they, they shouldn't necessarily in a situation like that. Um, but it, I think also that someone who's, if they're really lower middle, like, like if they're really poor and they're white, they're probably not going to be applying to the same schools as someone who's really wealthy. Like, in the first place, like I, I'd hope they would be able to, but then you got to factor in money as a. 
Anyone else? Anyone else try to have that question? Why should a, a wealthy person of African American descent be treated more favorably than a poor person who's of, of, of white descent? Okay, I have a couple. Okay, line up. Um, well, like, first of all, I believe, like, if colleges are, like, uh, denying people who are white and accepting people who are, like, African American, I don't believe that's discrimination. I think that's promoting diversity. Because if we just accepted everybody that was white, then maybe the entire school would be white, and then we'd have another situation where people who are African American would be suing the school. So I believe that people who, the colleges that are just not completely discriminating, but just accepting as a factor of race, they're actually promoting diversity. So I don't really believe that it's really should be called discrimination. And like in the part of like P. Diddy's son, he was accepted solely on the fact that he had got a football scholarship. So right. if people, so if people who are like African American and they're succeeding in sports, I don't believe that that should even be a factor. If they're good at sports, they should get the scholarship no matter what, no matter their right. income. So maybe if I can ask you a follow-up question about that. Um, the in the University of California system, you can't use affirmative action. And I think the chancellor of the University of California system made a comment that um, the amount of the freshman class is almost predominantly white and Asian has grown a lot. Yeah. In other words, because they're not able to consider race as much, that the class is becoming predominantly white and Asian because uh, they tend to have higher SAT scores. Um, I think you would think that's probably a problem of how that works. Yeah, I mean, like, if you, like, I think UC Berkeley has, like, 40 or, like, to 42% Asian. I feel like, of course, we should be accepting people who did succeed in high school, but we should be promoting racial diversity, and that should be a factor, of course, but I don't believe it should be a prominent factor, but I think when we have a problem where we have, like, 40% white and 40% Asian, and then the African American and Native American community is getting, like, Put aside. I think that is a problem. Spanish okay, also. Yeah. I, I have I have hands raised up. Okay. So uh, is that okay? Um, to uh, Dylan, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure if you would know the answer to this question, but I've heard that like the UC schools do, like they tend to not accept Asians as much, or they they still try to put races in as a factor. Where if you say you're Asian on your application, then um, that like I've heard that you're not like as likely to be accepted. Do you know if that's still true or if that still happens? Uh, I have no idea. Um, but schools are very creative at looking at race without actually saying they're looking at it. So it wouldn't surprise me, but I really don't know. Right. Um, all, by the way, everything that I'm telling you about UC schools might change in a couple months. Who knows why it might change? Because California is having a whole bunch of problems with money. Oh no, oh, your state's your state's in trouble anyway. I'm talking about the rest of the country. Why would this change everywhere? Because of this case? Yes. Yes. What could happen in this case that will change the situation? The Supreme Court could say that affirmative action is unconstitutional and violates the Equal Protection Clause. And what happens if it says that? Then colleges have to stop considering race in their admissions process. Right. So this is even bigger than Prop 209. So now it would actually be unconstitutional for any kind of state or public schools in California or elsewhere to use race in education higher admissions. But also, if they re if they say that it is constitutional, would that overturn Prop 209? No, no, it won't. Prop 209 will remain regardless of what the Supreme Court says. Okay, so these are sophomores, so they haven't had gov yet. So can you just, uh, they haven't had government civics and that whole, you know, process. Can you, um, can you just uh, explain to them why it would not overturn our particular proposition in California? Even if something is constitutional, there's no requirement that the government must do it. So even if the government can use affirmative action, there's no requirement that they must use affirmative action. Did everyone write that down? Yes. <laughs> Can you repeat that for them? I think it's a really sure. important point. Even if the government can use affirmative action, 
there's no requirement that they must use affirmative action. So Prop 209 will remain because really, after 2003, in the Michigan case, the Supreme Court said you can use affirmative action in certain contexts. Prop 209 was from 1996. It remained on the books. And actually, a number of people challenged Prop 209 after the Michigan case. And the court said, no, this is fine. So can so, I, just, I, I just want to jump in here. Um, so for example, you guys, um, if uh, California State uh, uh, student speech, um, student press in schools, right, student newspapers, there are quite a few limitations in a lot of states, right? And the Supreme Court has said that schools can have a right to uh, limit uh, student um, uh, press, right? In certain cases, I'm not going to go into detail. And then Professor Blackman, you can correct me on this. However, California State said that even though schools can limit it, we're not going to. So California State student newspapers have quite a bit more freedoms than in other states. So that's another example of even if it's constitutional for the schools to limit press school newspapers, that they don't have to actually, um, they, they don't have to um, uh, follow it, okay? Right, right. and I guess the flip side of that, California has a very funny law that says all private schools must comply with the First Amendment. So say in most states you had a private college, you could have a group on campus that excludes people, a private college, and say they exclude people based on religion. In most states that would be fine. But in California, if you have a, a, a private college, you can't have a group that excludes people. This came up a couple years ago in the uh, Christian Legal Society versus Martinez case. This was came coming, I think, uh, UC Berkeley or, or UC Davis, or one of the schools in California, um, where there was actually a Christian group that sought to exclude from its memberships people who were not Christian. And you might say, well, what's the problem with that? If you have a Christian group and they want to make sure that only Christians are members of their elected board, that should be fine. Well, no, the Supreme Court says they're bound by the First Amendment and they can't exclude people based on their religion, even though it's an inherently religious group. So there are lots of cases, specifically for California, that limit uh, or that provide additional constitutional protection for all schools. All right, so let's um, get back to the our, our case. Go ahead, you had a question, yeah. Sean? So you talked about how people give affirmative action to African Americans because in the past their ancestors had to go through a lot of hardship and that it set them back, right? Okay. Your question? Well, I, I thought, well, my question was then, but haven't other groups also had to go through a bunch of hardship, you know, like the Irish back on the East Coast when our nation was new and, you know, the Chinese during the gold rush. Didn't they also have lots of hardship and discrimination that they faced? Yeah, and that's a really tough question. Um, I think it's safe to say that whatever the Irish or the Chinese went through, the African Americans had it probably much, much worse. Um, the issue is, are we willing to treat people unequally to achieve some sort of very important end? And I think most people would probably agree that African Americans had a really, really, really difficult time in this country. Um, and not even 100 years ago with the gold rush or, or you know, 75 years ago with uh, immigrants in Lower East Side. We're talking 30, 40 years ago um, that, that, you know, we had separate luggage counters and segregated schools. It's not that long ago. So the argument is that for African Americans in particular, the, the feeling towards strong uh, programs to help rehabilitate their, their ability to compete is, is there. Um, that argument, though, starts breaking down a little bit when we look to other groups. Um, you know, for example, uh, Hispanics, women, um, you know, other groups where it's not clearly as strong of an interest. So the attorneys who have made these arguments have shied away from that point. They haven't pressed the fact that we need to focus just on African Americans because they've had it worse. Because if you say we do African Americans only because they've had it worse, then there are other groups who haven't had it quite as bad who would not get the benefit. That's why attorneys have seized on this phrase of diversity. That they want to have, uh, you know, diversity in colleges. When you use something like diversity, it's a broad concept. It includes men, women, children, people with disabilities, different sexual orientations, whatever. So that's been kind of a strategic shift to move away from the fact that 
we need to focus on only African Americans because they've had it worse to, we have to focus on everyone for diversity's sake. Um, and to someone very smart strategic decision of how they litigated that issue. And then Professor Blackman, sorry, I know it went by really fast, but we have one more minute left in the class period. Okay, so any questions from you students for me uh, about law school, being an attorney, anything like that? Where'd you go to law school? I went to law school at George Mason. It's Arlington, Virginia. What law, wait, what law do you study? I'm sorry? What law do you study? Uh, I teach constitutional law. This is what I do for a living. Um, where do you stand on the Fisher versus University of Texas case? Yeah, I, usually don't, I usually don't have an opinion on these kinds of things where I give predictions. Um, I think it's going to be very tricky uh, if the court decides to get rid of affirmative action, they're going to be cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of other aspects of life where, where race is used. And if they get rid of it here, it'll probably fall apart everywhere else, and there'll be a lot of implications. And we'll have effectively Prop 209 for the entire country. Okay, another question? Have you ever gone in front of the Supreme Court? No, I mean, I, I've been to the Supreme Court, but I've never argued in front of it, no. Uh, that, that would be pretty awesome. I've never been able to do it. Uh, if any of you are ever in Washington, definitely go and check out the Supreme Court. I'm trying to go for an argument. It's a lot of fun. Can All right, any other questions? Okay, uh, okay, any other questions? Okay, let's uh, give a round of applause. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's very interesting question. Good, very insightful question. We hope you all do well in your class. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Hi, Josh. Hi, uh, Megan. I haven't officially met you. Hi, likewise. Thank uh, you. Have fun. So I just wanted to um, ask you a couple of questions myself. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, and I'm really dark, you can't even see me from where the light is. Uh, so in the, um, with, I just had a couple questions, if you just have a couple minutes on the whole SCOTUS thing. Uh, this, uh, so once um, we, we sign up and they, um, they get to predict their justices, right, and obviously do the blogs, what I couldn't really figure out is how the whole bracket thing worked. Of course, I have like, Probably three quarters of my class are boys, and they got all excited when they thought to see that we were going in brackets. I mean, they think that this whole idea is really awesome. So, um, how does that um, the whole bracket por portion work? Well, the competition is for writing blog posts, uh, writing the briefs for the uh, Fisher case. Okay. So, if, if they submit the brief that we suggest, there's entirely some instructions. At, probably at some point in March or February. We will pick the top, you know, the top eight teams in the country, and we put them in the brackets. So they won't get seated until they write the briefs, and the winners do that. Okay, so they, we would have to. Um, so uh, the justices is one thing, and then yeah, um, there, are three, would, there are three contests. There are three yeah. contests. One is making predictions. One is writing the blog post, and one is actually competing in the virtual Supreme Court competition. And the first round of the Supreme Court competition is writing the briefs for the students. Okay. So writing yeah, the brief. the website, there's a link for contests in each of those. Right, yeah. I was just unsure because it seemed like it went on the writing the briefs that you chose schools to write the briefs. But you only chose, you, everyone submits briefs and then right. you. And we okay. pick the top ones, the best ones. Okay, great. Um, so sorry about the technical difficulties. For some reason, I guess I was still logged on our old chat, so I couldn't get us on our new chat. So sorry, it took a little bit longer on that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and then I think uh, I th think I could figure out on the video. Um, I think I needed to click YouTube. So if you do this with somebody else, there's an option on the side of my screen yeah. that maybe if I would have clicked YouTube, it might have worked for the video pulling up. Yep. Yep. Um, but uh, there were all sorts of um, pop-ups that were flying up on my screen. So I'm glad the screen share was able to just deal with that a little bit better. Okay, I'm glad that worked. Well, thanks very much. Hope your class right. enjoyed. Okay, thank you so much. And please, please tell your friends to sign up. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.